This is the Aims of Public Policy Address. Uh, this was instituted by the school some years ago, indeed uh, more than a decade ago, uh, to do th two things. Uh, one was to provide uh, a member of the faculty with an opportunity to talk about how he or she saw public policy and the purpose of public policy, how they thought about what they do and thought about what they think. Uh, and second, to provide an opportunity for you as an incoming class to get uh, a flavor of the school from a member of the faculty. It, it's important as a, as a preparation for this to realize that this does not mean that the remarks uh, that uh, my colleague is about to make represent the official policy of the school, insofar as the school has an official policy. Uh, if you were to listen to 14 such addresses, you might well come away with 14 different ideas of what public policy is and what the aims of public policy are, and we're very comfortable with this. Uh, on the other hand, we, we enjoy my colleagues and I listening to a member of the faculty talk about uh, uh, the way he or she thinks, uh, and we think it's good for you. And we feel more comfortable with a lot of people in the room, which is why we've decided that you should be here. Uh, our speaker today is, uh, is Deputy Dean at Harris and Professor uh, at Harris. Uh, he arrived at the school some years ago. I forgot to ask Ethan how many years ago, six years ago or so. Uh, and was unusual in that when he arrived, he felt that data were sort of an unnecessary intrusion into the thought process. Uh, it's perhaps not too much to say that he was a pure theorist, but he surely was a theorist, uh, and data made him uncomfortable. Uh, since then, he's, he's embraced data, or has been embraced by data, in a way that has gladdened our hearts until today, when it turns out that having been exposed to data, he now sees in data uh, something that approaches the end of the world, at least reading, uh, reading the title of his talk, which is the pearls, of the pearls of Quantification. I assume he's going to tell us how the way other people treat data is a really bad idea, but the way he treats data is a really good idea. And we'll find out if this is true. I'd like you to welcome my colleague Ethan Buena de Mosquita, the only professor here with a more difficult name to pronounce and remind, remember than mine. Ethan? Thanks. So when they asked me to give the aims of public policy address, I've come to some of these, but I wanted to know a little bit sort of what the purpose of the, of the aims address was. And I was told uh, the following, quote, that my job is to inspire in you the belief that evidence-based public policy can benefit society. To inspire in you the belief that evidence-based public policy can benefit society. However, I'm one of the instructors in the, in the core this fall. So I'm going to be inspiring you for the next 10 weeks. And I thought I'd take this opportunity instead to provoke you a bit. So I've chosen as a topic, as, as, as Colm said, the perils of quantification, which is meant really to sort of interrogate some of the assumptions that lie at the heart of modern policy analysis, especially a policy education like yours that's going to be focused on evidence-based policy. So I hope that in doing so, in, in provoking you in this way, and I suspect provoking my colleagues a bit too, I'm going to help spark some excitement about what is really a precious opportunity to spend two years not just honing your craft, but engaging some really fundamental questions, which is, after all, what one is really supposed to do at a university like this one. So although my topic is the perils of quantification, I want to start by affirming that quantification, in my view, is, is essential, although perilous. So quantification forces us to clearly define questions and concepts. It provides us with opportunities for serious evaluation of policy and a comparison of alternatives. It compels us to confront trade-offs. It replaces speculation and sentiment with rigor and precision. And it creates a framework of contestability. When costs and benefits and values are quantified and compared, the terms of debate are clear and, and what evidence means is shared. These features of quantification are critical for democratic accountability, and they're critical for good policymaking. So though quantification is essential, it isn't perfect. I think there are some deep problems that quantification creates that might be avoided or at least mitigated if we were a bit more reflective about what it is we're doing when we quantify. And I'm going to mean that not in the sense that I'm going to give you a talk today about how to do data analysis. I myself am not a data analyst. I'm a theorist. And uh, I'm not going to talk about what, what is good quantitative work and what is bad quantitative work. I mean the thought about what we do when we quantify in a slightly more philosophical way. 
So to get into the perils of quantification, I want to start by sharing with you the following vision of policy analysis. Not that. That's the title of my talk. The following vision of policy analysis, which I take to be pretty much canonical. It's taken straight from the standard policy analysis textbook by Edith Stokey and Richard Zeckhauser. So in this, in this vision of policy analysis, the way it goes is this. We identify some problem in the world that needs solving. We identify all the possible courses of action we might take to address that problem. We analyze the likely consequences of those various actions, and this often involves some quantification, right? We analyze data, we evaluate related programs, we measure effects. We then value all the possible consequences, and again, here we usually quantify. That is, we try and usually do something like get a monetary measure of people's values for various outcomes. We, in the jargon, call this people's willingness to pay for various alternatives. And then we engage in some sort of cost-benefit kind of analysis. And then we use our answer to step four to choose among the various alternatives. So in this pretty linear scheme, quantification is really just a tool. Right? There's a machine that starts with some social goal, presumably given to us by politics or ethics or what have you, and ends with a policy choice. Right? In between, quantification helps us to measure and it helps us to assess and evaluate the various alternatives and make a better choice. This view, I think, is pretty standard. We tend to conceive of quantifying in order to assess and evaluate in service of the aims of public policy, which are given to us elsewhere and by others. But I think this view is misleading. So I want to explore the idea that quantification and the aims of public policy are not separable, but instead inextricably interlinked. Okay? We can't neatly divide the world into the aims of public policy on the one hand, and objective, technocratic, quantitative tools in service of those aims on the other. Rather, there's an inherent feedback between the two. How and what we quantify shapes our vision of the aims of public policy just as our vision of the aims of public policy shapes and determines what we quantify. The fiction that quantification is some wholly objective or technocratic undertaking in, in, taking, informed by but separate from the aims of public policy lies at the heart of the three perils of quantification that I want to talk about today. So the first is the ways in which quantification shapes the normative, which is to say the moral standards that we use to evaluate policy. The second is how quantification narrows our field of vision, limiting the set of policy problems we acknowledge exist or can be addressed. And third, how quantification at times distorts the incentives of the people who make and implement policy. So I'm going to take these in turn. It's a pretty, but pretty useless truism that good policy serves the public interest. The problem, of course, is knowing what that public interest is. And these tradi there's traditions of political and moral philosophy that are deep and vexing, attempting to address this issue. And not surprisingly, they're replete with all sorts of competing and often mutually exclusive values. Now, almost all quantitative policy analysis is rooted in a set of normative standards that are closely linked to utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is a form of consequentialism, that is a normative framework for evaluation that evaluates policies based on their consequences. Loosely, utilitarianism holds that an act or a policy is better than another act or policy if it tends to increase the, if, if the former creates more net utility, which is to say well-being in the world, than does the latter. There are, of course, many normative positions one might hold that are not utilitarian. For instance, there are good and convincing arguments for various rights and duties, like the right to control your own body or the duty not to coerce your fellow human beings. And a reasonable person might well hold that good policy should respect or even promote such rights and duties, even if doing so reduces the net welfare in the world. This, for instance, is a position often held by, say, principled opponents of the death penalty, or torture, or stem cell research. There are also good and convincing arguments for having concern not only with the total utility in the world, but with its distribution. A reasonable person might well be willing to sacrifice some total welfare in the world in exchange for greater equity. Now, as I said, despite this sort of rich panoply of, of normative frameworks that are out there in the, in the moral and political philosoph philosophical literatures, essentially all quantitative policy analysis is rooted in utilitarianism. And not just utilitarianism, but to lay my cards on the table, what I'm going to call crass utilitarianism. Crass utilitarianism is a utilitarianism concerned only with material costs and benefits. Now, as a matter of intellectual history, I believe actually that the commitment to quantification precedes 
the commitment to utilitarianism. We're committed, we're committed to quantification for all the reasons I started with. Quantification is essential to making good decisions and weighing trade-offs. Right? So because we're committed to making good policy, we're committed to quantifying. Now once we've just committed to quantifying, we're pretty much committed to some sort of consequentialism. It's really the only game in town. What is there to quantify in the end other than consequences? But a quantitative consequentialism is at least in principle a pretty flexible kind of thing. It need not be crassly utilitarian. We can put a value on various non-material factors like rights, duties, you know, dignity, responsibilities, what have you. Moreover, once you know the quantitative effect of a policy on people's welfare, you can introduce, introduce all sorts of equity considerations into your evaluation of those policies. To take an example, instead of liking one policy better than another, if it just increases total welfare, you might like one policy better than another if it increases total welfare subject to the constraint that, say, no individual has more than 10% uh, above some other, any other individual. Okay. So what does crass utilitarianism have going for it that it, that, it, that it underlies so much of what we do? I think the answer is that what crass utilitarianism has over all other normative frameworks, even other, over other consequentialist frameworks, is that it lends itself so easily to quantitative analysis. It's hard to figure out how to value rights and duties and dignity or how to weight equity considerations. It's much more straightforward, both conceptually and practically, just to measure material costs and benefits and add and subtract and choose the, choose, let the policy that has the highest uh, total win. Indeed, crass utilitarianism is so easy to work with that very early on in the intellectual development of quantitative policy analysis, it became just kind of part of the standard assumptions that lie in the background of almost everything we do. And as a result, we're not just crass utilitarianism. We're unreflective crass utilitarians. The process of trying to maximize net utility, ignoring questions of rights and duties and dignities and responsibilities and so on and so forth, is so ingrained in our thinking that we hardly even know we're doing it. For us, the process of comparing material costs and benefits is almost the definition of searching for good policies. And here we see how misleading is the linear model of policy analysis in which quantification is just an objective tool in the service of the independent aims of public policy really is. Instead, I'm suggesting that the very notion of the aims of public policy that underlies modern policy analysis is driven in a deep way not by philosophical or political values, but by the dictates of quantification. That is, we don't quantify because we're utilitarians. We're utilitarians because we quantify. Reflecting on similar themes, actually, I'm, uh, bizarre for me to quote this, but, but I think Foucault kind of put this best. Foucault says that modern policy analysis, for a modern policy analyst, utilitarianism has ceased to be a philosophy or even an ideology. It has become a technology of government. I think that's really right. So what's wrong with this, right? We've agreed that if we want to consider rigorous if we want to consider policy rigorously, if we want to weigh trade-offs and have a contestable framework, we got to be consequentialists. So why not be, you know, why not use material utilitarianism because it's so, I mean, it's, it is so easy and convenient to work with. What's the problem? So to give you a sense, I want to tell you just two stories. So the first is I once listened to an academic presentation on the effects of taking children out of abusive homes and putting them in foster care. And the researcher found the kids are better off in foster care, and in fact, enough better off that the benefits to the kids outweigh the cost to society of providing the foster care. And from this finding, the researcher drew a policy conclusion. Let's say, the kind of kids he studied, we should be taking them out of their abusive homes, we should be putting them in foster care. This conclusion was met by, with some skepticism. Right? And the main critique was that the researcher hadn't measured all the relevant costs and benefits. And the researcher seemed confused, said, no, no, I measured the benefit to the kid, I measured the cost to society, the benefit's bigger, what's the problem? So the interlocutor and the, and the researcher went back and forth for a while, and then sort of it became clear what was going on. The questioner was pointing out that the researcher had failed to estimate the willingness to pay of the abusive parents to keep their kids at home and presumably continue to abuse them. And so hadn't estimated one of the costs of foster care relevant for a utilitarian calculation and so couldn't reach the, the policy conclusion under a sort of crassly utilitarian view. Now, you might think that a reasonable person would respond to this line of questioning with something like, well, that's true if you're really a crazy utilitarian, but I kind of think in a civilized society there's other values and kids have a right not to be abused and we really shouldn't give a damn about the preferences of parents to continue beating their children. And of course we should take the kids out of foster care. That is not how the researcher responded. Instead, I, 
to my continued amazement to this day, he conceded the point. And he said, you're right, I really can't reach the policy conclusion because I haven't measured the willingness to pay of the parents and I don't know what the optimal policy is. Right? This is a person who had deeply ingrained the crass utilitarianism and so had made a mistake in his research concluding we should take abused kids out of abusive environments. The second story is maybe a little familiar to some of you. It involves a memo written by Larry Summers, who was President Obama's um, chief economic advisor and, um, and treasury secretary when he was chief economist at the World Bank in the early 90s. Summers had the following thought, which I've written here for you because it's a good time. Okay. He had the following thought. Shouldn't the World Bank be encouraging more migration of dirty industries to less developed countries? The cost of health impairing pollution depends on the foregone earnings from increased morbidity and mortality. From this point of view, a given amount of health impairing pollution should be done in the country with the lowest cost, which will be the country with the lowest wages. I think the economic logic behind dumping a load of toxic waste in the lowest wage country is impeccable, and we should face up to that. But for that last sentence, you're going to talk like this by the end of next quarter. All right, so the, to the, the claim that toxic dumping in low-wage countries, countries has impeccable economic logic is an interesting kind of assertion. So here's three claims that seem to me to be correct. One, it is probably the case that the marginal cost of a little more toxic waste is higher in rich countries than in poor countries. Two, that probably means that if we shipped some toxic waste from rich countries to poor countries, the total utility in the world would go up. And three, if those are the only costs and benefits we care about, and we're utilitarians, then shipping the toxic waste is probably good policy. Okay. To call that chain of arguments economic logic is telling. For step three really had nothing at all to do with economics, it had to do with values. Right? But I suspect for Summers, as for many modern pr practical policy analysts, the assumption that good policy equals utilitarian policy ap applied to material costs and benefits is so deeply ingrained it just gets folded into the standard assumptions and thus can be counted as part of the impeccable logic. Okay. Now I don't mean to suggest that there's nothing to recommend Summers view. Right? There's important arguments on, on his behalf. Suppose Summers is right that transferring the toxic waste would in fact increase total utility in the world. Then the rich might be able to more than compensate the poor for taking the toxic waste and still be left better off themselves. So if we have the technological capacity and the political will both to get the poor to take the waste and to force the rich to pay them for taking it, we might be able to create sort of a win-win situation. Okay. It's worth noting that Summers' memo doesn't actually express any concern for this kind of principle of compensation. For Summers, the crass utilitarian argument on its own suffices. And I think both these cases are interesting for a lot of reasons. The Summers' memo especially illustrates for us, I think, both some of the benefits and promise of quantification and some of the perils. Quantification pushes us towards crass utilitarianism, which can lead to these kind of ruthless and absurd policy conclusions. But the discipline of quantification also really does teach us something. For many of you, it might have been the case that the rich dumping their toxic waste on the poor appeared to be a policy with absolutely nothing to recommend it, because you have yet to be educated in policy analysis. Right? But the exercise of quantifying and examining the costs and benefits and trade-offs forces us to see that there really is an argument to be made for this policy, even if ultimately you come down on the other side. There's an argument there. In both cases, I think we could, we could realize some of these benefits of quantification, right? precision, weighing trade-offs, contestability, and so on, but reach less objectionable conclusions if we were to wed quantification to a more nuanced thinking about these normative concer concerns. In the case of the Summers memo, for example, imagine that Instead of his crass utilitarianism, we ad adopted a normative position, say, based in a kind of non-paternalism, a principle that said something like, look, if two adults want to engage in some exchange, who are we to tell them not to? Okay. We would actually, I think, if Summers' argument is right, reach a conclusion, an outcome very similar to, to Summers, but we'd think about it very differently. For the crass utilitarian, the, you just adopt this, the ruthless position, right? The ruthless position is, ship the toxic waste to the poor. They have low wages, so dying a horrible death isn't so costly to them as it is to us. That's the argument on that memo, right? For the non-paternalist, you think a little more compassionately. You think, look, if we facilitate a market and the poor are willing to accept the toxic waste in exchange for some compensation from the rich and the rich are willing to pay it, who are we to get in the way? 
Right? In both cases, the toxic waste gets shipped. But in one, the poor are both empowered and compensated. Right? And neither of those facts is, I think, irrelevant. My concern then is not that quantification can't be wedded to nuanced normative frameworks or normative evaluation. My concern is that in practice, what we see is quantitative policy analysis overwhelmingly dominated by crass utilitarianism. Right? I fear this is because crass utilitarianism is so easy to use with quantitative analysis that it's hard for us to overcome the impulse. And so I hope even as you hone your policy analytic skills here, that you'll try to remember that there was a time, and here I'm paraphrasing my colleague Chris Berry, that you didn't believe that the word efficient was a synonym for the word good. The drive to quantify also plays a critical role in sort of defining our field of vision for policy. I want to talk about two ways it does this. I'm going to start with how quantification affects our notion of intertemporal trade-offs across generations. And then I also want to talk about how it disincentivizes policymakers from addressing certain kinds of problems. Okay. So a great virtue of quantification is it forces us to think about all the costs and benefits. One important kind of those is benefits or costs of policies not just for now but for the future. Here I think the best example comes from environmental policy. Right? An, intervention, an intervention limiting carbon emissions right, to slow global warming might have relatively small benefits in the short run. It's unlikely, I hope, that climate change will be dramatic enough in the next 20 years to have a really serious effect on the quality of your life or mine. But suppose that same policy, right, over the long run, prevents catastrophic climate change. It could ultimately save the lives of billions of people. Right? So the benefit to future generations might be huge. And this presents a very deep challenge. The future is essentially endless, and the population is expanding. And this means if we treat the members of future generations as sort of our own equals for the purposes of cost-benefit analysis, a policy that offers even a small benefit in the future will have a huge total benefit, since the future generations are so large. And this creates two problems. First, if we believe that the members of each generation should be treated equally in our utilitarian calculations, we really ought to be willing to sacrifice huge proportions of our own resources in pursuit of policies that benefit future generations. Because even large costs to a few billion people's now are but a drop in the bucket compared to benefits to hundreds of billions of people in the future. So I hope you don't like air conditioning or travel or meat. The second problem is that since all the policies that benefit the future have essentially infinite benefits because there's so many people in the future, it's really hard to compare the costs of benefits of two future benefiting policies. Everything, when you think about the future, looks either infinitely bad or infinitely good. Neither of these is, is tenable for a technology of government. It provides no answers about how to compare various future benefiting policies. Right? And moreover, no politician wants to be told that good policy requires that he or she sacrifice her, his or her own constituents for some people who are going to live in 500 years. So in response, quantitative policy analysis has come up with a practical solution for dealing with this problem called discounting the future. The idea of discounting the future for policy analysis is inspired by the way we think about intertemporal trade-offs for individuals. Okay, if I offer you a dollar today, that's worth more than you to you than if I offer you the promise of a dollar a year from now. Right, so imagine that I was uh, willing to give you, it's the Harris School, there, uh, here's some equations. Suppose I was willing to give you a dollar a year from now and you told me you'd take 90 cents instead today. That tells me that you're discounting the future by a factor of 0.9. So if a year from now I asked you the same question, a dollar in two years versus a dollar today, right, you'd take 90 cents a year from now, which is to say a dollar two years from now is worth 90 cents to you a year from now, and, since, and 90 cents a year to you from now is worth 81 cents to you today. So we can value all your future streams of benefits. Right? And of course, this exponential diminution in the value of benefits carries on into the indefinite future. So if you're discounting at 0.9, a dollar in 20 years, here we have for the years in the future for discounting at 0.9, a dollar in 20 years is worth about 12 cents, a dollar in 50 years is worth about half a cent, and a dollar you know, 100 years is worth nothing. So when we do cost-benefit analysis for policy, we directly extend this methodology to thinking about the benefits of policies for future generations. Official government documents make this the law of the land. The OMB, for example, writes, uh, discounting reflects the time value of money. Benefits and costs are worth more if they are experienced sooner. So the further into the future 
some future generation is, the less we care about it for the purposes of cost-benefit analysis. Right? And you can see this solves our problem of infinite future benefits. We just kind of write off the distant future through discounting and get on with the business of comparing short and medium run costs and benefits. But there's something quite fishy about this practice. Discounting for an individual and discounting across generations are really fundamentally different. It's one thing to say that you value a benefit to me now more than a, a benefit to me in 30 years. After all, if you offered me the benefit now or in 30 years, I'd take it now because I might be dead in 30 years. It's something entirely different, however, to say that you value a benefit to me more than a benefit to my grandchildren simply because my grandchildren won't be around it for another 30 years. Right? After all, if you ask them, would you prefer a benefit to granddad BDM when he was 40 or a benefit to yourselves when you're 40, I suspect the ingrates would choose themselves. Right? More fundamentally, if we think about everybody as sort of equal in these utilitarian calculations, it just doesn't make any sense to write off people in the future just because they're going to be alive later. Right? Their happiness and suffering will be no different than our own just because it's going to happen a couple generations from now. So this kind of logic has compelled economic theorists. Frank Ramsey, who in the 1920s really laid the intellectual foundations for how we think rigorously about intertemporal considerations in policy evaluation, argued that discounting the welfare of future generations is, quote, ethically indefensible and arises merely from the weakness of the imagination. A little more poetically, the mid-century economist Roy Harrod said that discounting the benefits to future generations is, quote, a polite expression for rapacity and the conquest of reason by the passions. Right? All the more disturbing that it's part of official policy. To make this concrete and maybe a little hyperbolic, think about the recent near tragedy in Indiana, for those of you who were around for the summer, in which a young child was stuck in a sinkhole in the dunes. It turns out the sinkhole resulted because the dunes were built on top of a forest of trees which are now rotting underneath and letting the sands collapse. Okay, I have no idea what kind of analysis was done when the dunes were built, but an analysis in, say, 1950 that would be consistent with generational discounting could have gone something like this. If we build this thing on top of these trees without cutting them down, that's going to hold costs down, and lots of kids will get to play on these dunes for lots of years, and that'll be a big benefit. Now, it could be at some time in the distant future, I don't know, say the 21st century, the trees will start to rot. There'll be sinkholes and some kids might be suffocated. But we conclude through discounting that those kinds of distant concerns can't possibly, be, can't possibly justify the cost of cutting down the trees now. Right? Such a conclusion would be crazy precisely because it's crazy to discount the future benefits of, in, of future generations in the same way we discount the future benefits to our future selves. Okay? We discount the future in policy analysis because if we don't, we can't quantify costs and benefits in a coherent way. It's just impossible. And yet, by discounting the future in the way we do, we profoundly change our field of vision for policy. Most importantly, once we've accepted discounting, we've given ourselves license to ignore any costs and benefits that will occur more than one or two generations in the future. Right? If you're discounting at a rate of 0.9 and somebody comes to you for $10, billion, $10, million, $10 million for a policy that is guaranteed to save a billion people in 200 years, given government figures for the statistical value of life, you should say no. Now, this may sound theoretical, but it has practical implications. In particular, one of the most common complaints about cost-benefit analysis comes from environmental regulators who find it incredibly difficult to pass regulations through cost-benefit analysis that take actions on environmental problems like global warming with relatively modest short-run consequences but, content but potentially catastrophic long-run consequences. Cost-benefit analysis with, with discounting just doesn't care much about those long-run consequences because they're going to be suffered by somebody else. All right, another critical way in which quantification narrows our field of vision for public policy is by pushing policymakers to focus their efforts on issues that are easily quantified whether or not they believe those are the most pressing issues. In the United States, as I've said, quantification is the law of the land. Under various executive orders, promulgated by multiple presidents, in particular, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs inside the OMB can, for all intents and purposes, veto any ma major regulation by an executive agency if it finds the cost-benefit analysis wanting. So what does this sort of restriction mean for policy? It means that regulatory agencies know that they should, they should only bother with attempting a rulemaking if they can pass an OMB review. 
So Lisa Heinzerling, who's a Georgetown law professor and used to be head of policy at the EPA, says the following about it. From the moment a person in, at EPA thinks of the possibility of issuing a rule, they start to think, will OMB let us issue this rule? It affects everything in rulemaking at the agencies. We're constantly asking ourselves not, is this the right thing for the environmental protection, but how can we make this acceptable to the OMB? Of course, this is exactly the point. If quantification requirements don't change the kind of regulations we get, there was no point in having them in the first place. The concern, however, is that these sorts of requirements don't only push EPA or other agencies from pro to not promulgate regulations for which the cure is worse than the disease, they might also forget, prevent them from promulgating regulations for which there are good arguments, but for which it is impossible or at least too expensive to quantify the costs and benefits. Indeed, if you read EPA documents, you'll often find, say, a description of two kinds of diseases. They want to control some contaminant, and there's two kinds of diseases. One, for which they can quantify the effect of the contaminant on the disease, and two, for which they can quantify the cost of the disease. And then another list of diseases for which they believe the contaminant affects the disease, but where they can't do one of those two steps of quantification. The first list gets fully integrated into the cost-benefit analysis, and it's very important in the case for the policy. The second gets stuck in an appendix on a list of qualitative concerns to be thought about if anybody ever feels like it, which nobody ever does, and become irrelevant. And so EPA is deterred from potentially doing important kinds of regulation, lots of agencies, I picked, up, picked EPA just because it's easy to think about, from doing lots of potentially important kinds of regulation, not because we don't, the best experts think that there wouldn't be big impacts, but because we, it's either too hard or too expensive to quantify them. Now this may be an, an inevitable and worthwhile cost. An alternative system with less quantification would, of course, have much more wasteful and inefficient policy. Right? So the benefits of, of quantification may indeed exceed its costs. But the concern is this. We may be like kind of the proverbial drunk searching for his lost keys under a lamppost late at night. A passerby asks the drunk, what are you doing? And the drunk says, I'm looking for my keys. I dropped them in the park across the street. The passerby is confused and inquires, why are you looking here under this lamppost if your keys are across the street? And the beggar says, are you kidding? It's dark over there. I can't possibly find my keys. This is where the light is. Right? Quantification shines a bright light on certain policy areas. But if a large group of important policy domains are left in the dark because quantification is too hard or too expensive, by insisting on quantification, we may be forcing ourselves to search for policy problems and solutions in the wrong places. Let me end with one last peril of quantification, the effect of quantification on incentives. Here's the basic thought. Typically, we can only quantify a few of the many inputs that go into addressing a significant social problem. And incentives tend to follow quantification and measurement. If we want to hold teachers accountable, and the only thing we can measure are test scores and graduation rates, we think, look, let's give teachers incentives if they do better on, if they improve their te students' test scores or if their students' graduation rates go up. The problem is that giving incentives only on these quantifiable and measurable tests creates all sorts of perverse, perverse distortions in behavior. Right, consider the state case of high stakes testing. What happens when you start rewarding teachers for the results of their students on these tests? Well, they start teaching to the test. Right, so the upside is that you may in fact induce them to work harder, but, by, but you also distort their incentives. Right? In particular, you push them to teach to the test in this way. Now, classroom time is limited. So when you incentivize teachers to emphasize skills relevant for the test, you also incentivize them to de-emphasize other less measurable skills. Right? Things like conflict resolution, self-control, creative thinking, and so on. If the non-quantifiable skills are important enough, this distortion in the mix of skills that the teachers teach may lead to an outcome that is worse than the outcome with no incentives at all, even if the incentives did in fact get the teachers to work harder because it got them to work on the wrong things. This problem is not limited to education policy. It's everywhere where some inputs are measured and quantified and others aren't. Right? In crime, crime policy, the introduction of, uh, of systems like CompStat for the quantification of crime statistics incentivizes law enforcement to focus their efforts on policing to get results on the measured outcomes. And disincentivizes approaches that are may be productive, but on less, measurable, on less measurable domains. I have a quote here from a, police of ch a chief of police who says, quote, we're not doing community policing now. We're doing comp stat. Right. In health policy, if you manage to find a way to measure the quality of, uh, of outputs, outcomes for patients, right, 
and you give incent physicians incentives along that line, they may well work harder to get those good outcomes. But one way they may do so is by screening their patients and trying hard to turn away the most difficult cases. And so by strengthening incentives on a measurable, quantifiable dimension, you've reduced incentives on a critical, unmeasurable dimension, the willingness to take on the sickest patients. Right? In economic policy, when you choose which economic indicators to measure, you create incentives for politicians, especially close to election time, right? to sacrifice progress on unmeasured dimensions that may be very important for long run, the long-run economy in order to get short-run progress on what, whatever the latest numbers, the most recent numbers to come out are. It's intuitive to us that measurement and quantification should be good for accountability incentives, and there's a sense in which they obviously are. The better you measure some outcome, the stronger the incentives you can create for that outcome, be it test scores, crime solved, patients cured, or what have you. But in a world in which only some outcomes are measurable or quantifiable, it's not always best to create those strong incentives, because stronger incentives for the measurable outcomes mean weaker incentives for the unmeasurable outcomes, and those hard-to-measure outcomes may be just as important. So you're about to sit off on a two-year education focused on quantitative policy analysis. This is a very good and very important thing to be doing. You're going to spend little time reflecting on these kinds of philosophical concerns, right? nor should you. In order to learn the skills you came here to learn, you need to buckle down and focus on the task before you, not be distracted by philosophy. But with that said, I hope this isn't the last time you wrestle with these issues. Quantification is invaluable, but it is also perilous. It does, in fact, have the potential to alter, and some would say warp, our normative evaluation of policy, to narrow our field of vision, and to distort incentives of policymakers and policy implementers. And as you move through your careers as policy professionals, I hope you'll use your quantitative skills that you're going to work so hard to acquire here in ways that are sensitive to these concerns. Because both of these perspectives, I think, are essential if your goal is to use your policy education to, in fact, make the world a better place. Now I'm happy to take some questions, and then you should go do some problem sets. <laughs> it seemed to me to be just as much about the role of public policy as it is about, the, as about, normative, as about quantitative analysis, right? I mean, I guess my question would be, to what degree do the things that are not quantitative fall under our roles as policy analysts? And to what extent do they fall under our roles as humans? You know, like if I'm saying this is a policy, here's my policy analysis, hat, you know, analysis, whatever, and here's what I think as a person. Uh, and in other words, like, in, there, there's certainly other actors that play here <clears throat> that, that might bring some of these other things to bear. Like, other people, I mean, the, the policy analyst isn't the only person in the room. There's going to be other people who might have other perspectives. So I guess my question is, to what degree is this a critique of quantitative analysis, and to what degree is it a critique of public policy analysis? I think that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, thanks. Uh, so I guess I have a, a few thoughts about this, um, none of them perhaps particularly clever. Um, but. I, I think there, 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 there's two ways to think about this. So one is I think you're right that, that this talk kind of took a holistic view, right, as though the entire policy process happened inside a person, right? And so I want to urge you to think seriously about what you mean by good policy, right? Although you're right that there certainly are institutional settings where good policy is, let's say, determined by your boss, and you're told to tell your boss the impact of some program on whatever measure it is your boss has determined the measure is you should care about. And I think that's wholly right. Um, that's wholly right. And, um, and then there, right, there's, a, there's a sense in which your institutional role is really this, I mean, we can call it this for, for, for the purposes of the institution, this objective piece of the machine whose job is to analyze and tell the people who are setting the values what the answer is, right? I think that's right. That's, I, I guess the way I think about it is that, um, I want to address this talk to you, the future policy leader, not just you, the future backroom policy analyst. And so I think that the quantitative perspective, um, I think many of you are going to go on to very important roles in government or in, in the private industry interacting with policy. And you're, in fact, going to be in a position not just to answer questions in a purely technocratic, um, cog in the machine kind of way. You're going to be part of the discussion about the values that guide policy. 
I hope. I feel certain that's true for many of you. And so what I wanted to reflect on, I guess, is the thought that the kind of very quantitative training you're going to get, which I think is for sure the best kind of training to get uh, for this kind of role, does in fact push you to be blind to certain kinds of considerations that when you get to the point that you're no longer the person just a answering what's the result of the regression, but answering, given this, the result of this regression, what ought we to do, or which regressions ought we to run? That is, what kinds of impacts should we care about? What kinds of outcomes should we care about? What kinds of goals should we have? I want to sort of urge you to remember that the things that were convenient inside the models that motivate, quanti qual motivate, motivate quantitative policy analysis aren't the only values, and that the quantification itself has effects out there in the world that are important to think about. So I, get, I mean, I, I think you are right. There are for sure institutional roles where it's just not your job to answer these questions. Um, but those aren't all the institutional roles. And my ambition for you is that eventually you will be in institutional roles where those questions are really relevant. Um, I was thinking about how can we protect ourselves from these perils? And maybe we should use more of our common sense. And if that is true, if we should use our common sense, aren't there many other perils in trusting our common sense and the common sense of others? Thank you. Absolutely. So, so yeah. So I, I tried to say this a few times throughout. Um, but you know the overwhelming focus was on the perils, right? Um, there are perils, which isn't to say that the quantitative approach isn't the best approach. Right? An important lesson of, of the quantitative approach is that the fact that there's costs doesn't mean it's not the best thing, right? So it may well be that the alternative world in which you got, in which you went to the University of California in Berkeley and spent your time in policy school talking about things that matter and not learning to do rigorous policy analysis, would, would be worse. I think it would be worse. Right? This is the reason I work here. <laughs> they wouldn't have me in Berkeley. Uh, <laughs> um, no. That, that, so, so, so I don't want, so right, there are perils, which isn't to say all things considered the best thing to do isn't to be quantitative. I think the best thing to do all things considered is to be quantitative. But I think the best thing to do, I'm hoping that there's an even better world in which during your quantitative education and after, every once in a while we remind you that, for example, while the concept of efficient fits very beautifully into our models, and the models that we use to motivate all the ways we think about cost-benefit analysis and stuff, and therefore we tend to call the word efficient the word good, it's not the same. And later on, when you go to use your, your quantitative skills, you let some of your common sense or your more reflective philosophical position seep in. That you don't let us, for our purposes, we're going to tell you, don't, wor don't worry about it too much. Like, you've got a lot of stuff to learn here, and it's going to be convenient for us to focus on efficient. Or it's going to be convenient for us to focus on the idea that strong incentives are always good. Whatever. Um, and that's going to be fine, because you've got a particular thing to learn here. But but, and, and, and it would be worse just to go and say, let's, make, let's just make policy on common sense. Let's not measure anything. Let's not ever weigh costs and benefits. It's crazy talk. right? But it would be better still to be quantitative, but also not get too trapped in, in our ideology. We have one, right? even if we're not always aware of it. And that, that's all I want to say. I want to say, here are some aspects of our ideology. And they're not, they're not like deeply true. They're just things that we've adopted, because it's convenient for now to get the job done. But you shouldn't forget that. We have an ideology. I mean, and I say we. It's my ideology, too. Like, it's not, I'm, I don't want to distance myself from quantitative policy analysis, which I wholly endorse as, a, as an enterprise. I just want to say there's problems with it. And when you go out into the world, you could, you could do better by also being a little more reflective about some of these concerns. 